Uh, actually, it's a Samsung. Samsung. Okay. Okay. All righty. Welcome, everybody. So this is a session on, um, on OpenStack Tro uh, in terms of what OpenStack Tro is and how do you use the product. The audience, it has been set for a beginner level, so we're trying to make sure everybody can understand the basic concepts of the Tro project itself and how it's being used. So it's so both Shiv and I will be presenting. So my name is Sri Ram. Um, I work at Tesora. I'm the director of implementations there. So I work with customers both in pre and post sales. My name is Shiv. I'm a tech lead at Cisco. Uh, so I'm leading the team for setting up a database as a service at Cisco. So Cisco is uh, using Trove project for providing database as a service, and we'll talk about what Trove is in general, and in particular how an end user can use Tro in an enterprise scale. So it gives you a sense of how it can be used. So we are going to talk about Tro at high level. We are going to talk about the, the, the concepts. And then there's going to be a tutorial session. And we'll go over MySQL and Mongo and you know, what are the things you can do with it. One of the, one of the challenges here is that this this course I have delivered a few times, and it's usually around four hours long, so where I provide the in environment to everybody in the class and I walk them through hands-on, but given the fact it's only an hour and a half, what I'm going to do is I'm going to provide a demonstration of how the product works, a tutorial, but what I will do is I have with me this information in a thumb drive. It has all the virtual machines, the lab exercises, and everything like that, and people can come by and pick it up after the fact. And it has everything you need step by step with full screenshots on how you do everything that we do here. Alrighty. And I also have a few OpenStack Tro books. It's been written by the gentleman over there, Tal Dark I'm standing over there. So and the guy that's sitting next to him too. So it's the OpenStack Tro book. It's based on the open source Tro. And we have a few copies of it. If you would like to have it, let me know and I can provide that to you. Oh. And the Sorry, go ahead. On the questions. Yeah, right. exactly. The last thing is the questions. So given the fact the audience is varied, it would be good to have a baseline of understanding before we delve into questions. So I would request, if you have questions during the session, to hold them off, write it down. And once we go to the end of the session, I will allocate 10 minutes, 15 minutes for questions, and we can go into topics. And any questions you may have, everybody that's gone through the session would be able to appreciate that better. So what is true? So we are going to talk about the OpenStack Tro project. Yeah. So Tro is analogous to the RDS within Amazon Web Services. So for the for the folks in here, most if not all of you want to set up a OpenStack based cloud in your environment, or somebody has set up one, and you want to be able to provision and manage databases, right? So Tro is a project that has been created very similar to Nova for compute. Neutron for networking, Glance for image management, Tro is a project for database as a service. The Tro project has been incubated with an OpenStack in Havana, and then it has been integrated formally as a project in ISO. So it's, it's been like, what, two years now? So for the last two years, Tro has been fully incorporated and people have been using it. Um, there are many companies uh, that have used uh, the product of my company, the Tesora. And then there are a handful of companies that have set up the OpenStack, the community, Tro2. To give a background, it was started originally by Rackspace and HP. And subsequently, there's been a lot of contributors. So we joined the, the project, Tesora, that is. We joined the project around three years ago. And right now, we are the leading contributors to the Tro project. Other than Tesora, we have HP, IBM, Mirantis, um, eBay, Red Hat, that have all been contributing to the Tro project. Like I said earlier, Tro provides databases as a service. So using Tro, you can provision databases, and you can manage the lifecycle of the databases that you have been provisioned. One of the common misconceptions is, oh, database as a service, does it mean I can provision databases? Why would I need the Tro project? I have Chef, I have Puppet. Can I not use those? And before Tro came into being, people have been using those scripting tools to create databases because 
There was no formal functionality to do that. Now the Trove is there. So using Trove, you can create a database. That's great. But not only that, you can manage the complete lifecycle of the database. So you can, once the database is provisioned, all the carrying and feeding of that in terms of creating backups, in terms of scaling up, scaling down, in terms of setting up multiple databases, like for example, master-slave replication, failover, or database clustering, uh, multi-data center support. There are a lot of things that you want to do that are pretty complex if you are going to try to do it yourself and time-consuming. Using a project like Tro, it's push button if you use the Horizon dashboard. If you like to use the CLI, you run a command on the, on the screen and you can do that. And the tutorial that I'll be showing you will be going through some of, some of those. Tro project has been used by organizations both in a self-service mode where you provide your users the ability to go in and create their own databases and manage the complete lifecycle. And in some cases, operators have been using Tro in their existing mechanisms with the idea that when a user makes a request, they can serve their request very fast. So either approach is available. And then the last but not the least, compared to Amazon RDS and DynamoDB, using Tro, you can manage relational or non-relational in the same way. You can go to the dashboard and you have access to all the data stores that you have uh, made it uh, available, and you can create them in the same way. So if you talk about SQL and NoSQL databases, this gives a list of all the databases that are available today and the ones that are coming soon. So the OpenStack Tro project has got pretty much the community databases, like the MySQL, Postgres, Cassandra, Mongo community, Couchbase community, and things like that. And when we work with customers, they want supported databases, so we have taken the effort to support, for example, uh, MySQL Enterprise or the Datastacks Enterprise, which is the Cassandra version, as well as Oracle and things like that. So today, if you look at Trove, both the Community Trove as well as the Tesora DBAS platform, if you take the two together, these are the databases on column one that are being supported. And pretty soon, you have Vertica, Couchbase Enterprise, Mongo Enterprise, and those are available too. Ah, okay. Fantastic. So, obviously the community has been contributing to the databases. Some of the original databases like Mongo, MySQL have been done by individual organizations that wanted support for them, and then they made it available upstream. But now what is happening is that, both from a community perspective, as well as enterprises like Tesora, the larger user community have been asking for new databases or new functionality on a database, and this, that is driving it. So as you look at adopting Tro for your organizational needs, you would find most, if not all, the functionality that you want in a day-to-day -day basis available in Tro. So like I said earlier, Tro doesn't just do provisioning. It manages the complete lifecycle management. Should you sure. want to just talk about that? Sure, yeah. As uh, Sriram was explaining, uh, Trove not only lets you provision a database, but uh, it helps you manage the entire life cycle of a database. Um, so, and also it gives a API which is works similar across all databases, whether it's a, a SQL database, a NoSQL database, a create database, API is exactly the same. So that's the best part of uh, Trove. So if you look at provisioning, uh, it lets you create a database, a single instance, or even you can set up a cluster. And for managing the database, uh, it lets you set up a replica set, which is a master slave relationship, uh, or it lets you take backups, regular backups, and restore, restore a database, and also it helps you scale up or scale down the storage or the memory or CPU, uh, depending on your needs. So as your needs grow, you should be able to scale up your, the scale down the database as you need it. And also, uh, by default, the database what's installed is tuned to the setup what you have. But if you need to fine tune it for your, for your own needs, uh, Trow gives an option to, uh, to set up configuration groups, which will uh, help you tune your database for your own needs if you need it to. And finally, uh, securing a database, like uh, if there's a OS patch or a database patch which comes in through, um, Trow gives a mechanism for you to upgrade and patch your databases uh, using the images which the Tesla provides uh, for any critical patches as you go along. 
So just wanted to quickly go over the 12 terminologies which we'll be using through the rest of the session. Um, guest image is the image what you get from Tessera, which contains both the OS and the uh, database uh, pre-installed. So it, it will be shown in glance. And when you provision the data, this image is used to uh, create your VM. Guest agent is the API which acts, uh, helps us uh, separate the, create a barrier between the individual uh, data types and um, the APIs. The APIs, as I said earlier, it's exactly the same if you try to set up a MySQL or Postgres, but the guest agent is one which will translate into your specific data, data store type or data type what you're using, database type. Tau instance is a, nothing but a database instance which contains the guest image and the guest agent. Uh, cluster is a set of uh, cluster databases which you can set up, for example, Mo uh, MongoDB cluster or uh, MySQL Perkona cluster. Data store is a data type. Basically, it's uh, MySQL Postgres. Uh, that's why we call it as a data store. Data store version is a version of the database like MySQL 5.6 or Postgres 9.4. Configuration group, as I uh, explained earlier, helps you fine tune your configuration for your database. So this is where you set up. We'll show it later. We'll talk a bit more uh, later. And flavor is uh, basically where you um, pick your uh, what you need for your compute, memory, or storage. So this is where you set up the pick up the flavor. That's what we call it as a flavor. So it uh, translates into the NOAA and uh, uh, storage uh, in the backend. Thanks, you. So these are all terminologies that we'll be using throughout the session to talk about a guest image turned into a, a database instance, spinning up databases based on data store, data store versions, fine tuning your instances based on configuration groups that we can create, and then scaling up vertically based on flavors that you want to use. So how do, you, how do you create a database using Trove? So basically, there are certain things that are needed to spin up a database instance using Trove. So we just talked about flavor, the kind of machine that you need. So the flavor support is something that you definitely need. And then when you create a database, the database itself, the data in a database is stored in a in a block storage format, so you would need Cinder Volume support for that. And in addition to that, um, what True offers is that not only you can you create a database instance, but for those databases that support the paradigm, as part of the database creation, you can actually create databases and users. So let's say that you as a user or someone in your organization wants to manage access to databases. So when you say, hey, I want a new database, they can create a new instance. You can say M1 large as an example. They can spin up a database in an M1 large. At the same time, they can create a database or the set of databases and create users that will manage those databases. So when you get back a database instance, you know for a fact it's got the databases and the user, so you can turn around immediately, log in as those users, and start accessing those database instances. And then configurations, we just, we just talked about it. Configurations are a way to fine tune your database, set up parameters that you want, and apply it to one or more databases at the same time and manage that. And the, and the last thing is that not only can you create databases, we talked about the lifecycle management. So when you take a backup, you can use Trove to restore the backup into additional instances so you have a number of instances sharing the same schema and users and the like. So these are some other things that you can do as part of provisioning a database and using the OpenStack functionality. Now that we talked about at a very, very high level about what Trove is, the background, and the kind of things that you can do with it, and the terminology, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually go in into a tutorial. Um, like I said, normally I would provide you these, these thumb drives, and you'll set, up, set them up in your laptop, and you do them yourself. But right now, because of the time constraints, I'm going to walk you through that. Like I said earlier, for those folks that joined in late, I have many more thumb drives. If you want to try it out yourself, come talk to us. We'll be happy to share them with you. It's where you can go try them in your, by yourself. So for the tutorial for today, what we're going to do is we're going to start with MySQL and go into Mongo. So we'll create a MySQL database. We'll show you how to create backups, how to restore from the backups, how to scale up, scale down, how to fine tune the MySQL databases that you've created using the tuning parameters that you want to use. And then we'll then go ahead and create a Mongo database. So you have a sense of using the same dashboard, you have a combination of SQL and NoSQL databases all living together happily. Yeah? So
So, so for those folks that are interested, so as part of the thumb drive, you get a a Trove virtual machine, a data, uh, a dev stack virtual machine. You get some sample scripts from Mongo and MySQL. In addition, you also get um, the coursework and the lab document and a copy of the PowerPoint deck that I'm just that I'm just giving you right now. Yeah. So moving on to the demo. So for this demo, even though we are focusing on the OpenStack Tro for this demo, I'm using the Tesoro DBus platform because we provide database guest images and we have a bit more functionality through Horizon Dashboard and is easier to easier to use there. So so this is the same Horizon Dashboard that you get with OpenStack, except it's got more functionality available for the database tabs. So I'm logging in as the admin user. And this is a standard tab. You would see the only difference is you will see the Tesora screen skin there. So, so the main thing that everybody would be using is the is the database tab under project. So if you if you look at it, you see databases, clusters, backups, data stores, and configuration groups. So under under clusters, you'll see the clusters. Under backups, you will see any backups that you have taken. And then the data stores will show the, uh, the data store types. She was saying earlier the database types. So for example, if you look at it, you see Mongo, MySQL, and Oracle in there. And it basically goes to show that in the current setup that's there, if you want to create databases and manage them, you can spin up MySQL databases. We are going to do that. You can spin up MongoDB databases, MongoDB clusters. And you can also spin up Oracle 12 and Oracle 11 databases. And the configuration groups is the one, like I said earlier, to tune your database. In addition to that, Tro uses the OpenStack functionality to orchestrate and to attain its goals. So Trove doesn't recreate all the functionality from scratch. So if you look at it, Trove uses Nova instances, Trove uses Cinder volumes, Trove uses images from Glance. So, so when you are spinning up instances, if you want to know the status of um, the Nova instances or the Cinder volumes, you can click at the, the compute section, and you can look at the overview, which shows the current status of your, your coda and the like. Instances show your Nova instances, and the Cinder volumes show your, the, the Cinder volumes for the databases that have been created. So if you want to create a database, Using the command line, so you would you would go to you'd go to the instances tab and you will go click on launch instance and you can create it. But a number of the folks in the audience here are probably comfortable doing things using command line interface and you want to get your hands dirty, so to speak. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to show certain things that you can do in the command. Obviously, everything that the Trove project is a full a first-class OpenStack project. So everything that you can do in Trove, you can do using Horizon, using CLI. And if you really want to get your hands dirty, you can access the REST API, right? So I'm trying to do, do certain things using CLI and certain things doing the Horizon, so you get a sense of the kind of things that you can do. So starting with, let's go use the, the CLI. So before you do that, you can just see that for the folks that are not familiar with it, the two tabs at the top are the user and then the and then the tenant tabs. Moving on to the CLI. So what we're going to do is we are going to create database instances and create backups using that. So before we do that, if at any time you want to say, okay, I want to run a command in tro, what are my options? Always you can always do tro help, right? It gives you a list of all the commands that are available along with a simple description. If you want additional details, you can actually specify the name of the command. So here are all the commands that are available today. And like I said earlier, we are adding more, both Tesora as well as the, the Trove community. We're adding more functionality to Trove. Now, if you say that you want to um, create a database, um, then you can always say Trove help create, and it gives you all the options. 
along with the values for those options. So for example, if you look at, if you look at Trove Help Create, um, you can specify the size of the database, the volume type. So you can, you can specify in Cinder different volume types. So for example, you may say that depending on your needs, you may have for dev test a regular spinning disk based volume type. And for, for staging or QA, you may want regular SSDs. And for production, for certain use cases, you may want high IOPS SSDs. So you can set up multiple volume types. And you can specify through Trow, when you create a database, what, what, what volume type you need. Now, obviously, we are seeing them as arguments in a command line. And when you create a database using the dashboard, they will be available to you as drop downs, and you can create using those options, right? In addition to that, we can also create a new instance using a backup as an option. You can say, I already have a backup. It's got my seed data. It's a bunch of users. I want to start with that rather than create from scratch. You can pass in a backup. That's available. And if you want to create a database instance in a particular availability zone, you can specify the availability zone. And then obviously, you can choose the data store and the data store version because that lets you choose Oracle 11 versus Oracle 12, as an example, or MySQL 5.6 versus MySQL 5.7, or MySQL 5.5. And the last I want to talk about is the fact that replica of. So if you want to create a master-slave replication, and you want to say, I have a master, and I want to create slaves based on that master, you can pass in the parameter, and you can say, I want to create a new instance based on this master. And you can use a flag for that. So, so let's go see it in action, shall we? So if you do a data store list, you get a list of data stores, which is in this case Mongo, MySQL, and Oracle, which is what we saw there. Then if you can say, okay, what versions are available for MySQL, you can say uh, 5686. And it shows it is MySQL 5.6. So 86 is the true version. It's not related to the MySQL version. So it's true related version of the MySQL what you're using. Thank you, Shiv. So um, this is one of the new advanced features that Trove supports. So a number of you that have databases in operation would say, hey, you know what? I have databases there, and it is uh, a MySQL or a Mongo or Oracle or whatever the database that is. It's, 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 it's running on a, on a Ubuntu or a RHEL environment. And it has, so you are saying, OK, every so often, your IT guys are after you saying you need to apply the latest you know, Ubuntu or RHEL patches, security patches, database patches, as well as bugs or features or enhancements that are happening with the, the Trove software itself. How do you keep track of all of that? So what we have done is, is, is use that, the dash 86, right? So there is a library of images that are created. And each image contains the corresponding bug fixes, security patches from the, from the vendors, along with the database vendors, and from Trove itself. So you can take the latest image. Let's say you were using 5685, and you want the fixes available in 5686. You can grab 586, and you can replace 85 with 86 in one single operation. So you have your data. We don't touch the data. The only the image is changed. So automatically, in one single shot, you know you got the, the Linux fixes, security patches, bug fixes, the database-related ones, and the Trove-related ones. You don't have to worry about any more of applying individual patches and making sure all your database, if you have 500 database instances running in a big server farm, you don't have to worry about, did I apply that fix to every single one of them, right? This way, you can go back in and say, do they all run 5686? Yes, you are all set. So, so, so that is that. Thanks, you were for bringing it up. So this is the command for, for, for Trove. I cheated, I'm sorry. I just wrote it down earlier so that I don't type in on the screen by mistake. So basically, quickly, let's go through that. So basically, the command is Trove create, and you provide a name for the instance. I am name challenged, so I chose MySQL 1. And then, and then 
and then the flavor is 101, and then if you do a NOVA, for the folks that are familiar with OpenStack, you can do a NOVA flavor list or a TRO flavor list, and you get the flavor along with the flavor ID. You pass in the flavor ID. In this case, I chose 101. And then you want to see the size of the database itself. So I ch choose to create a MySQL database with a size of two gigs. Then obviously I'm saying that I want MySQL data store. And by the way, I want the version 5686. And then in addition to that, like I said earlier, I said earlier, when you create a database instance, hey, you can create databases and users. So in this case, I create a database called database1, and a user called user1 of the password, password. So I ran the command. It shows that the command ran. So then if you want to look at the status, you can just do a trove list. And the trove list shows that it's in, it's in a build status. Now, given the fact it's video, now keep in mind, when you spin up databases, it takes a few minutes for the databases to come up. But I don't want you to wait for that long. That's why, as a recording as a video, I can fast forward to the completion, right? So now we can see that the database is active. If you do a trove show on the instance, it shows the fact that uh, you know the instance is there. It's got an IP address. It's active. It shows when it was updated and the volume and things like that. Given the fact that it's a MySQL database, you know the IP address, you know the user, you know the password. You can always connect to it using that IP address and uh, username and password. You can connect to it. If you remember correctly, we saw the database earlier. We created it called database one. So you see that that particular database is there, the database one. And if you then use the database one and you want to see if it's got any data in there, you can see that it's basically an empty database. So what Trove did is Trove created an instance. It created a database, a MySQL database in that instance, created a user to manage that. So from your perspective, either for yourself or somebody in your team, you can basically tell Trove to create a database instance. Within that instance, create one or more databases, users, and then you can provide the endpoint to your users, and your users can start using that. It's very straightforward. You don't, have to, you don't have to spin up Nova instances, SSH into them, and manually download the software and make sure you have all the patches. You can just, in one, one shot, as long as your organization has got Trove installed and configured, in one shot you can create an instance and start using that. So one we'll, other- We'll take it later. You had a question. Oh, so. OK, yeah. So if you could just keep your questions later, then once we cover it, we can go through all the questions, yeah? So like I said earlier, the purpose of Trove is not spinning up instances. It is also the lifecycle management, right? So just um, I want to quickly go into the, the UI and show the fact that um, when you create a Trove database instance, you also create additional things. So three things happen at high level as you're learning about Trove. When you create a database, you need an environment for the database to run in. And you need a place for the data to get stored. Like I said earlier, when you create a database, the data for the database gets stored in Cinder volumes. So they would be available under volumes. And then when you create a database instance, you need a machine, so to speak, a virtual machine or a physical machine, if you're using Ironic, for the database to run in. And then those machines are in, in your Nova instances, right? So what I want to do quickly show is that when you, when you look at it, you see the, the flavor, Trove Medium, which was 101 there, and also the Cinder Volume. We specified two gigs, and you see that two gigs have been provisioned. So if I, any time you want to know the status of your Nova instance and the volume, you can always check it there. Now that we have created a database instance, and you're starting to use that, let's see what other things you can do with that. If you want to create a backup, it's pretty straightforward. All you would need to do is run the backup create command, specify the instance, and name of the backup. So in this case, we said MySQL1, and the name of the backup is backup1. So then the backup is created. You can just do a trove backup list, and it would show the backup has been created, and, and the status is completed. So now, obviously, you can, you can have <coughs> full backups like we did right now. You can also have incremental backups. Um, and, the, and, and you can use them that way. So now if you look at the screen, 
the same thing that we did in the command line, you can, you can see it in action. And if you have backups, and if, for example, your team is creating some database and you're creating a backup, um, and then you want someone else within your organization to use that backup to do other things, then you can very easily do that. So to restore from a backup, that's what you would do, right? You'll go to restore backup. You get the same screen as you would. Now keep in mind, we created a Trove instance initially using the command line. I wanted you to get a sense of how would you use, com use command line to create and manage instances, right? That's what we said. Now, most of the end users and large organizations that want to use Trove database as a service will not be probably using command line. Some developers, yes. A lot of the end users, once it goes live, will be using the dashboard. I want to show to you what the experience will look like. So from now on, for the most part, we'll be using the dashboard. And obviously, like I said earlier, every single thing that we do in a dashboard can be done in a command line. And if you don't know what the command is, just do a Trove help. I'll show you all the commands and the options. So now we are going to restore, restore the backup. And we are going to, but keep in mind, if a backup was created with two gigs, you don't have to restore it to two gigs, right? You can say, I want a bigger database. You can create a 10 gig database and restore that backup, right? So those are, that's why you're given the options there. So you can say, I'm going to create a, a instance from the backup, and I'm going to call it, I believe, guest one. Once I start typing in my, in my recording, there you go, guest one. And then for right now, I did everything on my laptop, so slightly resource constraint, so I still stick with two gigs. And then I choose my, my database type, the data store, choose my flavor. And if you had different volume types, like uh, spinning disk, SSDs, high ops SSDs, then you can pick them from the drop down, And then you can choose uh, which availability zone you want to go into. So now one of the things... Locality was... Exactly. Yeah. Locality is basically if you want anti-affinity for your databases, where you don't want uh, the slaves and the, and the master to be on the same host, uh, you could say anti-affinity, and then it, it makes, uh, it tries to provision the, it provisions the uh, slave on a different host. That way, you're, you're sure that uh, if a host goes on, your entire cluster doesn't go down. Exactly. So you can have multiple databases across different hypervisors, and if one of them goes down, the other ones are still available. And then here, we are going, this is interesting, right? So we are, going to, we are going to say, by the way, in the advanced tab, we are going to restore from a backup. And you have a number of backups. You can pick and choose the backup that you want. And in this case, I have chose the backup I just created. And then when you hit launch, what is going to happen is you are going to, with, with the values you set on the first screen, using the backup, you are going to create a new instance. So now this would probably take around three minutes, three and a half minutes, or four minutes on the laptop. But for the purpose of this, we are going to fast forward. So build is happening now. The build is complete. It's pretty fast. So you can see that it's a MySQL 5.6. With the, it's got an IP address. And then you can see that it is Trove Medium with a giga RAM. And if, you and if you click on the instance name, you can see that it's got the IP address. And if you click on the users and the databases, it is the same user and the same database that we created on the first instance. Because we took a backup from there, and we're restoring using that backup. So obviously, it's the same thing. And the other thing that is important is that every time you create a database instance, whether it is MySQL, Cassandra, Mongo, Couchbase, Postgres, Oracle, whatever it is, each database has got a connection string to the endpoint. So what we provide as part of that, or rather what Trove provides, is when you click on the detail screen, you see the connection endpoint. So all a user has to do is grab that, and then copy paste into their client, and then provide the, we don't show the password, right? Provide the password in, and you can start connecting to the endpoint. And then there are a bunch of other things you can do through the screen. We talked about scaling up and scaling down. So if you want to scale up, you can say resource instance, resource volume, attach configuration group. If you want to manage root access, you can, right? to basically to increase the size of the volume. Initially, you have a database of two gigs. You say, hey, it's, it's pretty, pretty successful. There's more data there. I want to grow that. I'm going to go from two to three gigs. So you just change the value to the one you want. 
Now it's three gigs from, from two. If you say, hey, you know what? Once again, I need a lot of activity going on. I want more CPU, more memory. You can go from Tro medium to um, something else. In this case, I'm going to go with Tro medium resize. Just to show that it's very easy to use the dashboard to basically resize the flavor. Once again, all of these things are done in command line too, but you can just do that using dashboard by clicking and dropping down. right? So it's, it's very easy to create an instance, to create a backup, to restore the backup, resize instance, resize volume, to do all of that. And then we, and, and then we talked about configuration groups. right? So what are configuration groups? So initially, the database images that are available are tuned for your needs. But let's say that um, you want database, you say, hey, you know what, based on the work that your DBAs have done, you want to tune them to a particular values for the different parameters because that's what works for your organization. A lot of companies have that need. So how do you do that? How do you make sure every single MySQL instance, every single Mongo instance, every single Oracle instance that you're using have the same template? And by the way, after six months, if your DBAs want to tune it further, you go to one central point, you change it once, all the databases get updated automatically. How do you do that? Using configuration groups. So what you can do is we are doing configuration group for MySQL right now, obviously, but the same thing applies to all database types, or as we call it in Tro, all data stores. So you can create a configuration group. We create one for MySQL. So once you have a configuration group, it's, a, it's an empty shell. It doesn't have anything in there. What you can do is, you can basically add parameters to the configuration group. And if you want to know, hey, I don't know all the parameters that are available for a given data store, all you would need to do is click on Add Parameter, and Tro will give you a listing of everything that is available for that particular data store. Now keep in mind, these are the ones that are available for MySQL. If you're using Mongo or Postgres or Cassandra, it would be different parameters, obviously. You can pick and choose the parameter you want. You can add the value. A configuration group by its name indicates it's a grouping of a number of parameters, right? Instead of just one, you can have a group that's got, I don't know, how many ever you want. And when you apply it, all the values get applied. So if you want to know, uh, one of the things is if you are going to change the value of a given parameter, you want to know what was there to begin with, right? So we provide you that too. So if you go to this database, the one that we got from a backup, you click on the defaults, it shows all the parameters available and what the default value for those parameters are. So you can say, hey, okay, in this case, I'm gonna, in this example, I'm gonna use max connections. The default value is 250. And let's say that for your purposes, you wanted to go to 260 as an example. So okay, you say, that, that's what I want to do. So what you do is you go to the configuration group, you add parameter, and then you choose the one that you want. In this case, it's max connections. And you, and, and you enter the value, and then add parameter. So what you have is you have a configuration group with a particular parameter. If you want to add additional parameters, you can click on add parameter until you've done all the ones you want. Once you're done, you can just click on apply changes and the configuration group is created with that parameter. And then if you want to apply to instances, you can basically go to the instance that you want to. You can say, add attach configuration group. And then, and then what you do is you attach a configuration group. And then there you go. So the interesting thing is, if this parameter would necessitate a database server restart, we would automatically flag that and say data server restart, and you'll have to restart before you can access the instance using the Trove dashboard. We'll, we, we take care of that too. So if you want, so right now what we did is, as I was talking, we attached the configuration group to the instance. So if you want to know that, hey, has it changed from 250 to 260, one easy way to do that is go back to, in this case, MySQL, right? You can use a MySQL client, and you can go back in and see if it's changed. So basically what I'm doing is, I'm getting the IP address by using Trove show guest one. It shows it's running on 172.16.213. So I connect to that instance using, I believe the user is user one with the password, password. 
So I connected that instance. So then, obviously, in the case of MySQL, you have a number of variables. And the variables are those different parameters that we saw on the screen. And they have those values. So I'm going to look at the values for the variables, because the parameter that you chose was max connections, right? So we're going to look at the variables max connections. So now it was, by default, it was 250. We changed it to 260. If you want to change it further, you can go to the configuration group. You can change it in one place. And you can apply it to any number of instances, and they will automatically change at the same time. So that's what configuration group does. If you want to detach it, you can just detach that. So that's how you can very easily create and manage. And this is self-explanatory. If you want to delete an instance, all you would need to do is click on the uh, check boxes to the instance, click on terminate instances, and uh, it gets deleted. I think one thing to keep in mind is that for every Trove instance, you have a corresponding Nova instance and a center volume. So when you create delete instance, the first thing that happens is the instance goes into a shutdown state. So obviously, you can't do anything to that. While it is in the shutdown state, it goes behind the scenes, and it deletes the Nova instance, clears it out, gets, a res gets the resources back and clears the center volume. So when you delete an instance, the, fl the, the flavor instance is gone as well as, um, as well as the volume. But the one thing is, any backups that you take, they're still around. So you can create an instance, take a backup, and you can delete the instance because, you're, because you no longer want to pay for it. But the backups are still there. If you want to create a new instance in the future with the same backup, you know what? You can do that. And the one additional thing we are going to show is how, we, now that we talked about relational databases, MySQL, the kind of things that you can do, do to it. Now, there are additional things you can do. You can create a master slave replication. We can do failover all through the command line or the screen, or you can create Percon XDB clusters or MariaDB clusters or things like that. What I want to do is I want to show you how to create a Mongo instance and show that using the same dashboard for your users, you can have any number of different kinds of databases available. More importantly, what I want to show the fact is that true, it abstracts the way in which you deal with it. So the way you, in which you create a MySQL database to a Mongo database is exactly the same. So once you train your users how to use it, all they would need to do is pick and choose the database they want, and then off they go. And they want to take a backup, exactly the same way. They want to create a replication, same way. Cluster, same way. So in this case, I entered the values for the Mongo instance, launch, and I have the Mongo instance. So now I can see that in my dashboard, obviously for my tenant, the admin tenant, I have a MySQL database and a Mongo database. I wanted to do this so that you have a sense. Normally, this is something we'll all be doing it together. And in the thumb drive, you have instructions along with the virtual machines that you can start that have the MySQL and the Mongo database loaded. So you can go and do everything that we did and more in that, right? But given, that, given the fact we only have an hour and a half. No, no, I can, if you want, I can, I can just provide that to you, not a problem. You this, is, a, this, is, this is pretty big. It'll take you a long time just to copy it. So I'll, it I'll provide that to you. No, I can, I can collect the information. I can give it to you. No, not a problem. Not a problem at all. Um, so for those folks that want this, let me know. I, can, I have a bunch right now with me. And if, if you run out, I can send it to you. No issue. But my goal is for you to try it out and touch and feel and see how it works. So w one of the goals I have is to kind of walk you through introduce you to Trow, how it works, before going into 
the architecture, and some sample ways in which you can deploy. I wanted you to have a sense of how it works. Then when you talk about architecture, it would make more sense to you, right? So in this section, we are going to talk about how Trove itself is put together under the covers. And we are going to talk about Cisco InterCloud and see how they have deployed Trove in a scalable, highly available manner. So you have a sense of how it will actually be deployed in an enterprise manner, right? So in a thumb drive, running a single instance is one thing, but can you really deploy it in an enterprise way? Sure. So this is the Trove platform architecture. So for those folks that are familiar with OpenStack, you can see a lot of similarities, right? The OpenStack projects in a lot of cases are designed similarly, not the same way, but fairly similarly. If you, okay, I guess it was next one. Hold on. I think there is a lag here. Hold on. Hmm. Okay. I need help from the back. So, okay, you can see that. Maybe this will resolve it. Fantastic. We are back in business. So this is the, the, the true platform architecture. It says the Tesoro DBS platform architecture, that's because it's one of our marketing slides, but this applies to standard Trove too. So if you look at it, there are two boxes, right? This is the OpenStack box here. It's got all the OpenStack services. Like I said earlier, Trove does not recreate anything from scratch. It does not re, you know, re, recreate the wheel, if you will. It uses all the OpenStack structure. It is a core, in the sense core as in it is one of the major OpenStack projects. So it interacts with every OpenStack project. So for example, if you look at Nova, if you look at Cinder, Swift, Glance, Neutron, Keystone, they're all there. And if you look at the Trove box, you see Trove there. So there is a concept of, when you look at Trove, think of three things. A Trove controller, a metadata database, and a message queue. It's very similar to what OpenStack would do too. So the Trove controller is the brains behind the operations. So the Trove controller consists of three parts. The API service, the task manager, and the conductor. The API service is the one that you would always interact with to begin with, right? So you would say, Trove create, Trove backup create, Trove resize instance, Trove resize volumes. That would go, whether you do it through the UI or through the command line, you would go talk to the Trove API and say, go do this. And Trove would do that. And you'd get the request from Trove, Trove would update the message bus and say, go do this. There's a task manager service that's running. And what that would do is that would get the message from the message queue. It would say, okay, now let me go talk to Nova and see, first of all, let me go talk to Keystone and validate that the user can do this. Okay, user can do that. What tenant is the user in, admin tenant? Does the tenant have enough resources to do this operation? It would do all of those things. And if it fails, it'll come back and give an error message. And then it would go to Nova, spin up a Nova instance, go to Cinder, check to see if you have enough volume available, create a Cinder volume, and go to Glance, grab the image, put it into the instance, go to, go to Neutron, get an IP address, make it available to that, right? And if your command was throw backup create, it would go to the Cinder volume, read the data, take a backup, and then apply the backup and store it in object storage, which is Swift. We also support Ceph, whether it's Swift or Ceph, it would, it would store it in there, and then, when all those OpenStack services are running and you have the Trove guest agent there, remember we talked earlier about the guest image and guest agent. So in the Nova, in the Nova instance is the, is the guest image based instance running and it has a guest agent and any call you make goes to the guest agent and depending on the data store type, the call gets translated, right? Because Oracle would do backup differently than Mongo then MySQL, so that's what that would do. And then it would take, it would take that, create a backup from Cinder Volume, store that in Swift as an object storage. And the last thing is, any messages that are coming from different OpenStack services or from the guest agent goes through the Trove conductor. But the net net is, 
for the purpose of today, you have a trove conductor, which is the combination of API, task manager, and conductor. And we are going to talk about, in a couple of slides, about how to deploy it in an HA fashion. And you can think of those when you talk about controller. And the other thing are the message bus and, and the metadata database. You have two options. You can use the main OpenStack metadata database, or you can use um, your own metadata database. And the same thing with RabbitMQ or Cupid. If you, are using, if you want to use the main one for your OpenStack controller, you can use it, or you can create your own one. What we see um, from customers and audience in general is that they don't want to modify or touch the core OpenStack message QR database. So what we ended up supporting is you can have your own copy just for Trove, a MySQL database, a clustered format because you want HA for Trove, and correspondingly, a RabbitMQ just for that, and you can use it just for Trove. So that way, everybody's happy. So now, she was going to talk about um, how Cisco Intercloud is using Trove and how they have set it up and how they have done it in HA fashion. So this should give you a sense of it's all good to create single instances and talk about how Trove components are, but how do people use it in a real, in the in the real world example? Just wanted to take a few minutes uh, just to explain what Cisco InterCloud is. Um, if you look at the current scenario, you have public clouds uh, providers like Amazon, Rackspace, and you have private cloud providers like uh, uh, Microsoft. Uh, but there's not in, uh, there's no very little interoperability between these two between the between the clouds. This is where Cisco wants to come in. Cisco wants to build an InterCloud where Cisco is hosting the cloud. He knows. And it is used internally as well as by our external customers. And also, we host and manage clouds for our partners, who in turn can sell it to the customers. And also, we also help manage and set up clouds at the customer insider and manage it as well. So, and we, le we give a mechanism for you to move your cloud from either the private to hosted or the public in a seamless manner. You can move your, based on your application needs, you can provision a VM anywhere. That's what Cisco is trying to uh, do. And uh, coming to how we have deployed Trove at Cisco, uh, basically, uh, this is in a single data center. We have a service cloud, which is where all the management uh, VMs are there. And, and then we have a tenant cloud, where the tenant uh, VMs get provisioned. Uh, the service cloud is managed by the cloud operators uh, within Cisco, who control and manage the service cloud. but if you look at the tenant cloud, is totally for the tenants. Uh, so the service, the cloud operator can look at it, but he doesn't have access to the uh, tenant VMs. That way, we are securing the tenant's data. Uh, so coming, uh, <coughs> taking a look at it, uh, for the trow, we have a uh, trow, trow controller and the um, uh, DB for the metadata. We have a Percona color cluster, and uh, we have uh, created the RabbitMQ its own tenant DMZ just for security purposes because that's the only piece which communicates between the tenant cloud and the service cloud. That's why we have secured it in it, it, its own DMZ. And all the communications happen so through SSL. Just to be clear, right, so we talked about the architecture piece earlier in the previous slide. That architecture slide would comprise the service cloud, right? It has all the OpenStack, the Trove services, and that would be the service cloud. And from a tenant cloud is actual instances that an end user would spin up all the databases. So that would be the tenant cloud, right? So they will be dealing with the actual databases and the instances, and the operator would be dealing with all the, the services and making sure the services are up and providing all the necessary functionality. And if you look at uh, tenant A, that's his own network. The tenant A is uh, the VM secreted in, its, in, in his own tenant network. So no, uh, only the tenant has access to the database itself, uh, and the service cloud provider doesn't have access to the uh, database. Coming to, like, if you're doing in production, you need HA. So we have built uh, HA across all the trow layers. Uh, so we have created the, the trow controllers uh, behind a load balancer. Uh, so that way, you can assess through HA proxy. Uh, the trow APIs and the trow CLI comments or even the Horizon UI communicates to the load balancer. And for the back in my metadata database, we are using Percona Galera cluster, uh, master master in a master-master mode. Again, it's behind a load balancer, 
And for RabbitMQ, we're using uh, the RabbitMQ cluster, and we're configuring uh, uh, the cloud.conf to do uh, to connect to the RabbitMQ on a round robin basis. So even if any of the VMs goes down, your service is not affected here. So if, for example, if a row control goes down, you can spin off another new VM and uh, re restore restore it, and then automatically put it into the pool, and you're, it's seamless sort of thing. So there's availability um, all across the layers. So do you have time for the? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think we are slightly ahead of schedule. So what I want to do is there is a, uh, a slide we had kept uh, regarding monitoring, so we want to just kind of go through that too. Mm -hmm. so. Just one more thing means uh, monitoring is also a very important piece in production. It's like uh, how do you manage uh, your, your, your set up your production environment, but you need to monitor it and make sure that the service is 24 by 7, it's running 24 by 7. So as I said, in the service cloud, we have the Elk stack, uh, which uh, takes care of like the Kavana, Elasticsearch, uh, where we, uh, uh, which, my, which does the basic VM monitoring for the service cloud VMs, that's the Trow VMs, the Trow controller, RabbitMQ, and the Trow uh, metadata database. And also, we collect all the um, logs from the message queue, uh, monitoring logs, and push it into Kabana as well. That way, if there are any anomalies, uh, it, uh, we can uh, get uh, alerts created and get paged so that uh, a cloud admin can go and take a look at it uh, why the service is in a degraded state and take appropriate action. Similarly, on the, as I said, since we're not managing the database itself on the, um, for, for the customers, if the customer wants to look at a source, for example, if he wants to get alerted if there's a slow query running on the database. So what we have done is basically uh, we have set up uh, the basic VM monitoring as well as the uh, um, MySQL, D, uh, MySQL oops, sorry. That's okay. Just go back. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this one, and then you could push it to, we are pushing it to Cisco Zeus, all the logs and the metadata, but it's a monitoring as a service, but you could use your own monitoring as a service to capture the logs, and the alert goes to the tenant admin who is managing the database VM on the tenant side. So this is how we have done the monitoring. Yeah, yeah. I, th I, think, I think this is very important. Thanks, Shiva. I think if you take a step back and look at it, right, so if you are responsible for making sure your organization, uh, you have a scalable, stable database as a service. You want to do two things. You want to make sure it is highly available so there's no single point of failure. Whether it is a metadata database goes down, RabbitMQ goes down, or if one of the Trove services go down, because they're all behind HA proxy and load balancer. If one of them goes down, you can obviously spin up another one, put it in the place, load balancer sees it available and continues to use it. So there is no single point of failure. That's number one. And I believe you know, you could start with three or four, and you can obviously, depending on the quorum, you can add more and more to have it really scalable. The other thing is, it, it's good to have scalable solution, highly available, but you also want to make sure it actually works well and it performs well. For an individual database, we talked about configuration groups and how you can tune it with parameters and things like that. But for your services, you want to make sure you know, it is not being degraded memory-wise or whatever it is and it's performing well. So that way, both for that service cloud, where the operators are there, they want to make sure all the different row services, the metadata database and the RabbitMQ, they're all performing to the peak efficiency. And you can monitor through that. And from an end user tenant, they want to make sure, like she was giving an example of a slow query, right? If you have a My uh, MySQL slow query and if it's taking a long time, you want to know that so you are your DBA for your organization can go back and look at it and see what is going on, right? So is it because the parameters used to set up the MySQL itself, you think the configuration groups are incorrect, they need to be tuned, or is there something else going on? Is there a lot of IO at the instances? Do you want to go back and scale up, maybe? Whatever it is, right, you want to do that. So from the end user perspective, you have those monitoring. So between the two monitoring, both from the from the Trove controller perspective, as well as the end user perspective, you have monitoring for both. So this is pretty important. So when you are thinking about setting up something, I mean, all of you come from different companies and you all have different maturity level for your OpenStack and Trove. So this should hopefully give you some ideas on what it is that you want to do to set up something that you can actually use and people will be able to get value. You know, one of the things I said is, let's keep the questions till the end because we want to make sure we have, there are people with different background levels. We want to get a, a standard level before we talk in the questions. So we have, we have plenty of time. So 
you know, questions are welcome right now. Sure. Yeah, good question. So you can you can do networking either using Neutron or Nova networking. So given the fact that it's running my laptop, I chose Nova networking. So when you use Nova networking, it gets assigned automatically. But if I were to use Neutron, I would go to the networking tab and assign a NIC and do it that way. So the flavor contains, good questions, the, the flavor contains all three, right? It contains CPU, memory, and the, and the disks. But keep in mind, it is a disk for the instance, right? It is not the disk for the database. So you have a decoupled system. You have the Nova instance that contains the software on software alone. But the data is stored in a persistent state in a central volume. So even if the Nova instance goes down, your central volume is still available. I change the flavor on the instance. Uh, I'm sorry. I yeah. So when you change the flavor, it is for the database instance, right? Yeah, exactly. It's but not the. the but the just memory. to be clear, if the database has got, even though the instance might have, let's say, 20 gigs of space, the database size may not change because that is being maintained in the central volume. Hope that makes sense. Any other questions? Yeah. Sure. So I, I, think, I think you can do one of two things, right? I think, um, like I said earlier, other than some of the enterprise databases, other than that, most of the databases are contributed by the community. We enhance the database features from Tesora, but most of it's on the community. So if you want to participate in there, Doug Shelley, who's a VP of engineering, who's one of the co-authors of this book, he can give you tips on, he's smiling widely. So hey, Doug, one more member to your team. Uh, you know, you can contribute, start the process, and the community will work with you. Or, now I'm plugging in for my company. If you want, you can come talk to us. We'll, we'll, we'll be happy to help you out, either way. Other questions, please? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. It's a very good question. So as I tried to communicate, Trove uses the no abstraction. Oh, thank you, thank you. So the question is, we were, I was demonstrating Trove through virtual machines. The question was, can Trove be used with bare metal or containers? Right, I got the question, right? Yeah, so Trove uses Nova for abstraction. So right now, most of the OpenStack instances, for the most part, use KVM and you get spin up VMs. But you know, you ha you've heard of the Ironic project, right? Which is the bare metal project. So if your OpenStack deployment has got the Ironic available, and when you go to Nova and say, have the Ironic option, so when you create a new database, you can do it on bare metal. Now, containers is a slightly different um, thing. So the support for containers is, is evolving, so we expect the container support is not as much as bare metal or VM support is evolving. I think initially we had the Nova Docker project a while ago. Had that been around and if Nova had virtual machine, bare metal, Docker support, it would have been easier seamlessly to do all of them. But now Magnum project is there, so it's, it's, it's a work in progress. Hey, Doug, do you have any latest update on containers or whatever I told is still true? Got it. So just to relay what Doug was saying, there is a, it is still work in progress. There's a session this week to kind of talk about it. So I'm assuming it's gonna be a good three to four or five months before we have something that the audience at large can start using. More questions? Yes, sir. Yes. So it's a, it's a good question. You're talking V3 API, right? 
Hey, Doug, so the OpenStack API, will it support Trove or other, the other way around? This is the OpenStack API and not the Trove API? OpenStack common API. Well, it will, will we be other link to... Like the V3? Yeah. 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 It doesn't matter, yeah, it's yeah. work in progress. Work in progress. But I think my, my guess is since all the other projects are going through the OpenStack-based single API, I think it's a matter of time before we'll support it, but I think designed to be, discussions to be had. <laughs> yes, matter of programming. <laughs> it's easy for me to wear my hands from here, Doug. <laughs> Absolutely. Matter of programming, yes. Yes, sir. It's yeah. not single tenant. If you look at the way we have implemented in Cisco, the tenant A, tenant B was multiple tenants. Only the service cloud where we had one single tenant, but the tenant end means multiple tenants. So you could support multi-tenants in the existing uh, cloud. Yeah, that is, that is one example. And keep in mind, when you talk about multi-tenant, it is a loaded term. So are there, is there a specific use case you're looking at when you say single tenant, multi-tenant? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Oh. If, you, okay. If you are if you are, if you are if you are doing that, and you, and you okay. So, couple of different ways in which you can do that, right? So, in in one of the screenshots I showed earlier, once you create a database instance, oh, this is on the on the backup screen. Once you create a database, if you scroll down, you see the endpoint, right? So, once a database is created, the database endpoint, as long as, in your case, let's take there are two tenants. If those two tenants have the network ability to access that particular IP address on which the database is running, so like we, we, there's a question regarding where do you choose the network, right? So if you chose a network for the database to run on that both tenants could access, somebody can spin up a database, and the two tenants can access it. The two tenants, two tenants may not be able to control the database, like take backup and failover and things like that, but they can access the instance. That's one option. The other option is, we provide multi-tenant support through Oracle 12C and things like that, and that, that, that is available too. So if you want to take advantage of physical resources and things like that, you can do that. What Shiv said holds true. What I said about accessing the endpoint holds true. There are many ways in which you can do that. If you, have, if you want to have a more in-depth conversation, we can talk about your use case. Sure. Other questions, please. Very good question. So today, as of today, I didn't have a chance. I thought I'll be running over. I usually run over. I want to make sure there's enough time for questions. I didn't show that. Today, you can do a failover. That's push button failover. But we are soon coming up with auto failover, because people have been asking for that, absolutely. Other questions, please. So are there things, obviously, I did not show clusters. I did not show um, replication because I was thinking that I may not have enough time. Um, are there things that that you want to see that that I didn't have a chance to show that you are interested in, either clusters or cluster scaling or failover, something like that, that you would like to have seen today, in the session, that you came in thinking you were going to get at it that you may not have. Or whatever, whatever, given the background that you had, whatever we, you saw today was a good start for you, even, even that's a fine answer. Head shaking would be good, or hand <laughs> raising would be good too. <laughs> good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. So can, can you repeat the second part of the question? So you said, I mean, I, I, I got the point about commercial databases, multiple tenants, multiple VMs. Right. So, 
Yep. Oracle is, is a different beast all by itself, right? So if you, I believe, no, no, don't hold me to this. I believe if you have the, the Oracle Linux, I believe you can have VM-based licensing. Exactly. If you use, they support RHEL. So if you want to spin up Oracle on RHEL, I think you, they say license for the whole machine, even though you may choose to have only one VM running on it. Right? Now the other thing you can do, we are talking to a number of customers that want solutions for that, so it's an ongoing. Right now, the, if you want Oracle support using Tro within OpenStack, the only one that supports is our product, it's already bus platform, nobody else supports that. So one option for you is you, could, you can spin up instances using Ironic, right? So you can go to a physical machine and say, spin up an instance in there, and that way you can maintain the Oracle licenses. That's one option. Oracle virtualization is another option, but it seems it's more difficult than bare metal. Other thing is, for, for those customers that are talking to us today, they seem to have enterprise-wide license, so they don't have to worry too much about it. But it is still an outstanding issue for us as an enterprise to figure out a way for customers to do that. We do end up reselling licenses for data stacks enterprise, for example. If you want to do that, you can do that through us. But Oracle is work in progress. Sure. And then one other thing which we did not talk about today is we also support Oracle 12C multi-tenant database. It's expensive by itself, but forgetting that for a second, if you had that, what we provision is we, when you say create a new database, you can create a new pluggable database on a container running on the container server. So any database that gets created always gets created on the physical device, so you won't run into that issue. You have, you have to pay Oracle to use that, but once you do that, <laughs> you are safe from a licensing perspective. Other questions? Are there size limitations for the working database on size and quantity? Size limitations in what sense? Quantity that you can scale out over the Uh-huh. Sure. So I'm, yeah, so I mean, in your case, you could specify the, either the physical machine or the flavor, depending on what it is. Given the fact my laptop is smaller, I chose smaller ones, but you could have pretty big flavors and you can do that, right? And we are going to support rack very soon. So if you're talking about rack clusters and you want to distribute data that way, you can do that. But right now, if you just take a look at an Oracle 11G single instance, um, I can spin up a, a five gig Oracle database two or three on my laptop, but not more than that. But for your needs, you could spread up a M1 large or M1 extra double large or something like that, which has multiple CPUs, uh, a lot of memory and stuff like that, multiple cores, and you can do that. I don't know if I answered your question, but you have the flexibility to specify either the physical machine or the virtual machine, depending on your needs, and you can do Oracle there. And once rack support is available, you could distribute that load across based on the rack cluster itself. Other questions, please. Anything you want to ask Shiv, because they have spent a ton of time and effort setting up Trove for real-world users. Anything you would like to know, either for, from a Trove perspective or even from an OpenStack perspective, the challenges they had and things like that. Uh, plat platform as service. Uh, we are trying to build out. We are trying to get Cloud Foundry, but uh, we, it's still work in progress. Yeah, we are still not designed that yet, but we are planning. Planning. Okay. It's it's in the planning phase. <laughs> yeah. We have roughly 12 more minutes. Anything else I can help answer? Yeah. How Sure. Um, make it big in terms of what? Sure. So right now, hey, hey, Doug, there's a question on orchestration. Right now, we don't support heat orchestration. 
We don't trove doesn't support heat orchestration. That's something that's coming in there. Are you talking about heat? Are you talking about how things work under the covers in true? So what we have done at Cisco is we are using Ansible deployment. So we have our own Ansible deployment scripts, which goes and provisions uh, uh, entire end-to-end -end provisioning of the service cloud. We're using Ansible for that. Sure. No, it's something inbuilt within Cisco. So one of the things we are going to provide is our contact information. So. Given the fact that it's an open community, if there are questions that we can help answer after the session is over, you know, feel free to contact us. We'll be more than happy to help out. Other questions? Anything else we can help clarify, provide answers for? Going once, going twice. Okay. Thank so, you. So uh, yeah. So 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 b before we do that, two things. Um, if there's interest in, in, in deploying Trove, I mean, that we are contributing a lot to documentation for the community itself. It's still a work in progress. But if you want to know more about how customers are deploying, any general questions, answers, you can come to tesora.com. We can help answer. We can tell you how other customers have done, what you can do, and things like that. That's number one. Number two is that you have my email address, my phone number, and also shoes. and. I am happy to provide that in the thumb drive, but more importantly, if you go to OpenStack Summit page, this video should be available there, and you will have the same information. You can always get this and hunt us down, so not a problem, right? Thank you for attending it. Like I said, I have, I have a thumb drive for you, but if you want more, let me know. I have, we have a booth, and I have a, I have a few there. I'm happy to share that to you. For those ones that don't have it, I can get the information, I can, I can uh, okay. mail one to you.